I apologise, I'll have to deliver this. If there's one place on earth more bilingual than the, more monolingual than the Americans, it's Australia. So I will just do with that. Um, in fact, it's uh, uh, when my uh, younger brother was trying to learn French at high school, uh, they had to find somewhere for them to go and practice French. And the nearest place was La Réunion. Uh, <laughs> it's not easy. OK, um, so uh, what I want to do today is to describe what I think of as a, a very simple, um, almost uh, sort of deliberately, um, the, the word in English would be clod hopping. I guess that means in the manner of a peasant, a sort of peasant's approach to thinking about information in biology. Um, the, uh, and what I'm hoping to show you is that there's really no need in thinking about biological information to do anything more sophisticated, anything that takes us closer to the sort of debates about information that will be familiar to many of you from the cognitive sciences, that we can really have a notion of information that's uh, extremely straightforward, where a philosopher's criticism is more likely to be that we shouldn't even call this information, although I wouldn't agree with that. Um, so I want to contrast it, first of all, to a much better known approach to uh, this is a quote from the uh, famous biologist John Maynard Smith, who died a few years ago, um, one of the sort of major figures in Darwinism in the second half of the 20th century. And what's uh, unusual is that it's a paper in a philosophy journal, and it's a paper that's drawing almost entirely on philosophical sources, and particularly on the work of Ruth Millikan, who I'm sure many of you will be familiar with. Uh, in about 1996, I was at uh, a major biology congre uh, international congress of systematic and evolutionary biology, and John Maynard Smith, who was effectively um, uh, introducing each session of the conference in the light of his lifetime contribution, he was the great man at the meeting, um, uh, was challenged to say what he meant by information, which was central to his uh, the story he was telling at that time about the nature of biological organization. And he more or less waved his hands, and I wrote my notes down about this and later published it, and he never complained, um, more or less in the spirit of Shannon's information theory. Okay? And I, was, I wrote it down because I was so struck that one of the world's leading theoretical biologists talking about an idea at the heart, supposedly at the heart of his vision, had nothing more to say about information than more or less in the spirit of Shannon. And a few years later, he was, I think immediately afterwards, uh, Maynard Smith realized that that simply wouldn't do because what was central for him was that there was something di distinctively biological about information in his sense. And secondly, that, and this was very important for him, that uh, it was distinctively genetic, that somehow information was marking out genetics from other realms of causation in biology. And so in this paper, uh, he says, basically, we're going to do what the philosophers have done. We're going to appeal to the naturalized intentionality that can be created by the, the uh, figurative intentions of natural selection to underpin a notion of biological information. So by the information in some cause, we're going to refer to the effect that that cause was designed to produce by natural selection. And that's the framework that Millikan and others have elaborated at great length. Most recently, uh, Nicholas Shea at King's College London has been trying to elaborate Millikan's approach to information with additional supplementary conditions, um, specifically in order to show that this is what we should mean by information in biology. And unlike Maynard Smith, uh, Nicholas Shea believes that it's not only genetic causes that convey information to the organism, but he thinks that it's characteristic of all or nearly all genetic causes that they are distinctively informational, and it's unusual for environmental causes to be distinctively informational. So there's a kind of quantitative discrimination as opposed to Maynard Smith's hard line definitional discrimination going on. And this is a little scheme of uh, Nick Shays in which he, um, he thinks of 
the uh, selection of one, so the box at the top, the interesting thing about this diagram is that it has two completely different time scales. The box at the top is showing phylogenetic or evolutionary time, and it's just very simply showing one genetic allele being favored over another by natural selection. And the section of the figure at the bottom outside the box is in developmental or ontogenetic time in the lifetime of an individual. And it's supposedly showing the information which was built in the first box being read by the organism. So the idea is really very simple. Um, we, we think of the selection of one allele rather than another as giving us a naturalistic sense of that allele existing for a purpose. Its purpose is to do whatever it was selected for by natural selection. We use that notion of purpose to give us a normative success condition, so a truth condition or a satisfaction condition for a representation. And then when that allele causes something, we see that piece of causation as having a normative success condition associated with it. So we can distinguish between what the cause actually produces and what the cause is meant to produce. So we can talk about truth versus falsity, compliance versus disobedience, and other semantic notions. So it's a straightforward application. Um, the main difference between Shea's approach and Millikan is that Shea requires that as well as having this normative success condition, representations have to have straightforward Shannon information about the events that they produce. So when you contrast different alleles of a gene, they should contain Shannon information about the distinctive outcomes produced by each allele. Okay? Um, so I have a long-standing objection to this way of thinking about information in biology, namely that it is deeply and fundamentally incapable of doing one of the key things that we want information in biology to do. The whole idea of there being information in the genome is that the information in the genome is expressed in biological development and explains why organisms develop in one way rather than another. Okay? Now, teleosemantic information is an essentially historical property of representations. Whether a representation has teleosemantic information depends essentially on the history of that representation. Teleosemantic information doesn't supervene on current time facts, which means that the current time facts can be completely identical in two situations in which the representation contains information and in which it contains no information, from which it seems to me to directly follow that teleosemantic information is causally inert, that it can't make any difference to what happens in the world and therefore can't make any difference to what happens in biological development. So if you want to explain why a seed turns into a chrysanthemum and not a geranium, you can't do it by saying it has a property which would make no difference if you took it away. It can't be that that explains why you get a chrysanthemum and not a geranium. Okay. Um, one of my favorite examples here is, this is a cute little beetle. Um, it's a non-genetic example because I think using non-genetic examples takes away a lot of the magic associated with DNA and enables us to think clearly. Um, it's a beetle which has to grow in two different ways depending on which plant it grows its seeds on. It's a very famous case. Um, if it's grown on the little plant at the bottom, it's very difficult for the offspring to survive and they need to, to grow very fast and be quite big in order to survive to reproductive maturity. If it's planted on the big, if it's, the seeds are laid on the, sorry, if the eggs are laid on the seeds of the big tree in the middle, they can be small. And it's a famous example of the mother sending an epigenetic signal to her offspring to either grow fast and become large or to grow more slowly and to be smaller at the point where they achieve reproductive maturity. So it's a disjunctive, disjunctive developmental pathway with an epigenetic signal from the mother telling them to go one way or another. And in a teleosemantic framework, the signal from the mother can be seen either as an indicative representation saying you are growing on a Palo Verde tree or you are growing on a cat's claw bush, 
or it can be seen as an imperative representation commanding the egg to either grow quickly or grow slowly. Okay? Um, however, when you look at what the mother actually does, in one case she lays a small number of large eggs, and in the other case she lays a large number of small eggs. There's a very simple mechanistic explanation of how she succeeds in directing her offspring down these two developmental pathways, big eggs with lots of food, small eggs with less food. When you understand that, you understand how this system works. When all you know is that the mother sends the offspring an instruction to grow slowly, I put it to you that you understand nothing about how the system works. What's going on here is that you've taken an evolutionary explanation and that signaling theory model is a perfectly good model for thinking about the process of evolution, to think about it as the evolution of signaling, okay, um, in the sense of Brian Skirms, to those of you that are familiar with Skirms' work more in philosophy of mind. Um, perfectly reasonable to think of it in terms of evolution as the evolution of a signal. But thinking of it in developmental biology as sending signals and the organism reading the information simply gives you no explanatory understanding of how this system succeeds in driving little beetles down two different developmental pathways. Okay? That's the critique. So the critique is that teleosemantic information is the wrong sort of thing. Instead, I suggest, and uh, with my various collaborators over the years have suggested, that we should go back to a very simple and basic sense of information. It's a sense of information that's very famous because it occurs in one of the most famous papers of 20th century biology, Francis Crick's paper on protein synthesis in 1958. Um, this is the paper in which Crick proposed the so-called central dogma of molecular biology, that information flows from DNA to RNA to protein, but not in the reverse direction, and various other uh, basic ideas, at the time informed speculations about how DNA is transcribed to make protein. And what he says is, I use the word, so in this paper Crick famously says that uh, translating DNA and then, uh, sorry, trans transcribing DNA and then translating it into protein involves three processes, a flow of material, a flow of energy, and a flow of information. And the distinctive thing about his approach is that it focuses on the flow of information. What does he mean by information? He says information is the precise determination of sequence. Okay? That's what he means by information. So what I'm going to show you is that if we take seriously the idea that what information means is precise determination, and we understand that in the light of contemporary work in the philosophy of causation, we can generalize what Crick says in this paper, which hasn't really been taken very seriously as an account of information, and come up with an account that will do a lot more work in biology, and in particular will allow us to understand both epigenetics and non-genetic environmental heredity and their role in development and evolution. So it will do quite a big and exciting job, even though the notion of information is a very boring kind of information, notion of information that, um, as I say, a sort of peasant's notion. Introduce you to the concept of specificity in biology. As many of you will know, um, specificity is one of the core ideas in modern biology. It emerges in the late 19th century, um, basically in response to the insight that there is something fundamentally different about the chemistry of life from the chemistry of non-life physical systems. Namely, its high degree of specificity, its capacity to do exact things with both precise qualitative and precise quantitative outcomes. And that's what gives you, for example, why uh, a fact which in the 18th century I think a lot of biologists found quite puzzling, and maybe even in the early 19th century, why if a seed is purely a mechanistic physical system, you never ever get it to go from one form to another form by messing with it mechanistically. Why do you always get monstrous chrysanthemums, strange chrysanthemums, new and valuable chrysanthemums you can sell for more money in the flyer market, but whatever you do to it, you never get a geranium and vice versa. Okay? That's one of the ideas that gets brought under this idea of specificity.
Now, by the 1930s, the dominant uh, explanation of biological specificity is stereochemical interactions between molecules. Okay, so there's this view that we now understand what is so distinctive about, oh, perhaps by the 40s to get the full picture. Um, we now understand what's distinctive about the chemistry of life. It's that it involves weak non-covalent bonds and the physical shape of large and complicated molecules which allow those bonds to either form or not form in highly specific ways. That's what explains how enzymes succeed in controlling such specific reactions in cells. And it's also thought that what's distinctive about DNA is that in some way, DNA is a way of getting this highly specific chemistry from one cell to the next. So DNA, we've discovered, it's the, or we believe it's the material of heredity. And at a sort of mechanistic level, the general hypothesis is what it's doing is somehow transferring that very precise chemical catalytic specificity from one cell to the next, so making it a cell of the same type. Crick's move is to say that that biological specificity need not exist in the form of stereochemistry, and it can exist in the form of a linear code which contains the same information that will be expressed later on in the stereochemistry of the descendant cell. So that's the big move in this 58 paper. He calls it the sequence hypothesis. It's, in its simplest form, it assumes that the specificity of a piece of nucleic acid is expressed solely by the sequence of its bases, and that this sequence is a simple code for the amino acid sequence of its protein. Okay. So what we've got there is a genuinely new idea. It's that stereochemical specificity can be encoded and passed on in, in this linear coded form. And then, of course, the uh, central dogma, which says that it's a one-directional one flow from DNA to RNA to protein, one-directional flow of information. So what I want to do now is to show how we can generalize that idea. And the framework I'm going to use is one that's, as you, I'm sure you know, very popular in contemporary philosophy of the special sciences. It's the uh, interventionist or manipulationist view of causation associated with Jim Woodward, and perhaps more technically with the computer scientist Judea Pearl. Um, so at its absolute most basic form, the theory says that if we take a uh, formalized representation of a system in which causal relationships are represented using an acyclic directed graph, then when a relationship between two variables is such that it meets certain conditions making it suitable for manipulation, making that relationship a relationship that we can use to do things to the second variable. We can intervene on the first to change the second. So when the, the statistical dependencies in the network meet that condition, we can say that the first variable is causally related to the second. Okay, a very, very simple idea. Um, developed formally at great length by Pearl and expanded into a philosophy of causation, an analysis of what we mean by causation in the sciences by Woodward. And many other philosophers who I'm sure you're familiar with, Clark Gleemore and uh, many other people at CMU in America have worked within this framework. And it's these days, um, as you see in the journals, uh, one of the standard tools that people publishing on the philosophy of the special sciences reach for when they want a precise analysis of causation to deploy in some particular area. Um, in the absolute most minimal case, Woodward says that two variables are causally related if there are just two values of each variable such that switching between those two values on the first variable will change the corresponding two values in the other variable. So if the, both variables have big ranges, it's only necessary for there to be some tiny region within which one can be used to manipulate the other for us to say that there's a causal relationship. So in general, causation in this framework is an incredibly weak relationship. Everything has huge numbers of causes. So obviously what we need to do then is to specify additional conditions on what make causes powerful or interesting or explanatory. So Woodward uh, has developed um, a kind of qualitative approach to this, 
And a number of other philosophers have picked up on this and written in a kind of qualitative analytic philosophy mode about what might make causal relationships more powerful, more interesting, more explanatory. Um, so I'm not going to talk about proportionality today because I should have taken it off the slide. Um, not going to talk about proportionality because I want to keep things simple, but it, it's a, you can deal with proportionality as an extension of the, the stuff I'm going to talk about. Um, what I want to focus on is specificity. The idea is that there are causes of high and low specificity. Roughly, the idea is, so a good example is, suppose that um, one, of, one of, not that you're all being very polite, but if this was an undergraduate lecture and one of you was being a little noisy up the back of the class, there are two approaches that I could take to um, stopping you from talking. One would be to blow up the entire lecture theater, which would stop you from talking. The other would be to ask you politely to be quiet. Um, the former one would be a highly nonspecific cause of silencing the student at the back, and the, the latter would be a highly specific cause. Um, I could, for example, uh, ask him to speak a little more loudly or a little more quietly or to only whisper to the person next to him. I could engage in a kind of fine-grained control of the student's behavior through this particular channel. Okay? Uh, an example that's often used in the literature, although it's, it's not as simple as it sounds, is that uh, if you um, are selecting which channel you want to hear on your radio, that's a specific cause. And if you're just switching the, ra the power on or off to the radio, that's a non-specific cause. That's perhaps the standard example everybody likes to give. Um, so the idea is that we have a large range of values of the cause, a large range of values of the effect, and a continuous relationship so that we can use this cause to fine-grainedly manipulate the values of the effect. And that's a specific cause. Um, and that, of course, is pretty much the same thing that Crick was talking about when he talked about detailed residue by residue transfer of information. And uh, so, where am I going with this? Yeah. So suppose we were to identify biological information with specific causation. We were to say that the informational causes in living systems are those that are highly specific, and the very non-specific causes we're going to treat as um, perhaps conditions for the expression of information or background conditions relative to explaining something with its specific causes. Okay. So um, most uh, reactions that are controlled by an enzyme require a source of energy. The source of energy is necessary for, re for the reaction to happen. Nevertheless, the source of energy isn't specific to the exact reaction that we get. It's something about the catalytic properties of the enzyme that give us the specificity. So we'd say that's where the information is coming from. Um, why call this information? Well, uh, first of all, I'd make a, uh, um, a reference to uh, Crick. So many years later, Greg Morgan, American philosopher, wrote to Crick trying to find out why he was inspired to start talking about information um, and got the usual uh, polite but very dismissive response. Um, it was merely a convenient shorthand for the underlying causal effect. So as Jim Woodward, a couple of other people have commented, uh, Sahotra Sarkar has written a little bit, little bit about this, um, biologists seem to be drawn to the language of information when they're dealing with causal relationships of high specificity. And that seems to me to be enough to show that calling it information is not violating any part of the vernacular everyday understanding of that concept. Um, and secondly, I think it's just going to be vindicated in a kind of Carnapian manner. Why call this information? Because if you explicate the idea of information in this way, then it's useful for a specific project, namely for trying to think in a general way about the sources of order in living systems and the distinctive nature of living as opposed to non-living physical causal systems. Okay. Okay. So... Um, what we need to do is to uh, think somewhat more precisely about this idea and make it into a useful tool, um, which is what I've been doing for the last few years with various collab collaborators, um, particularly with Arnaud Pocheville. Um, so we want, if we, here are our definitions of specificity on the, um, your left, and here's a kind of way of thinking about how we start, might start measuring it. 
So the idea roughly is that um, if I want to know what happened to the student at the back, um, I could you say, tell me what Paul said to the students. And you'll know a lot about what happened in the classroom. So if I said something utterly sort of Donald Trump levels of political incorrectness, you can predict that the students will have left. Um, if I said, please be polite to your neighbor and don't talk so loudly, you can predict that the sound will go down a little bit. Um, you know an awful lot about what happens if you know the value of the variable, what Paul said to the class. Okay. Um, the idea is you're getting a lot of information out of knowing that. And more importantly, if you had control of that variable, if you had something implanted in my brain to have me say whatever you wanted, you'd get quite a lot of control over what happened to the students in my classroom. Okay? So specificity can be thought of as the relationship between two variables such that if you're given control of one variable, you know a great deal about what will happen to the other. So what we suggested was that you simply measure the Shannon mutual information between interventions on one thing and the other. And we had a little meeting about this. It was where this first paper came out of. We basically had um, uh, two philosophers, a um, sort of philosopher who's come out of software engineering, um, a mathematically minded philosopher, a biological maths, biological mathematics person, and an eminent molecular biologist in a room talking about what might we really mean by information in biology. And at the end of the uh, sort of, I think we were there for about five days, um, we ended up thinking that we should basically measure it using that uh, formula, um, which basically says if we control the background conditions B, so we intervene to control the background conditions, and we measure the mutual information between our interventions on a causal variable and our observations of the effect, we're measuring the specificity of the cause for the effect. Incredibly simple idea. Um, and so basically what we've been doing for the last few months is working out the consequences of that, showing that various other related notions of causes being explanatory or important can be understood as an extension of this very simple information theoretic approach. The thing to notice about that um, very simple formula is that you don't get a value unless you specify the distribution that you're going to enforce over the cause. So for that to have a value, you need to know what the distribution over C is. So what might you do? You might enforce all sorts of distributions. And one of the first things that we found interesting was that there are a number of views of what causal specificity is in the philosophy literature each of which corresponds rather neatly to a particular natural kind of distribution that you might pick and enforce on that cause. So there's a famous well-known paper in the Journal of Philosophy by Kenneth C. Waters um, called something like Causes That Make a Difference. And what Waters basically says is you should observe, he doesn't use the formal language, but the proposal that he gives actually translates rather beautifully. You observe the natural distribution of your variable. You come into the lab and you force the variable to conform to that distribution. And then you observe the range of values of the effect variable. And according to Waters, if you get a high, high level of specificity from the actual distribution, you, that's what you should mean by specificity. Um, on the other hand, if you uh, read Jim Woodward's work, uh, Jim Woodward has a, a paper, and there's another actually very similar paper by Sahotra Sarkar, both saying what you want is something like a bijective relationship between the values of the cause and the value of the effect. You want each value of the cause to take you to one and only one value of the effect, and each value of the effect to take you to a one and only one value of the cause. Now that, so both of these um, well-known philosophers have said, no, what you, what you mean by saying that something is highly specific is that the relationship is bijective, and then they deal with the fact that that's incredibly demanding and that being bijective doesn't come in degrees by saying, well, if it's kind of, you know, intuitively the sort of thing that you say is kind of nearly bijective, even though there isn't a measure of what that means, we can call that specific. That turns out to be 
just, a, I think, a way of gesturing at um, imposing a maximum entropy distribution on that cause C. So if you make every value of C equiprobable, okay, if you make every value of C equiprobable, you get what Jim Woodward would like to say is a highly specific, a measure of highly specific causation. Okay. Um, in more recent work, uh, and this is, as I say, an idea from, from Arno Pocheville, uh, we actually think there's a slightly better idea than enforcing that maximum entry distribution, which we call maximum specificity, which I'll talk about in a moment. Let me just kind of make more intuitive sense of these two ideas. What Woodward is really saying is, if I take two variables and I ask how much one of them causally explains the other, what we should do is to construct a, an ideal experiment with a completely balanced set of manipulations in which we look at every value of the cause and we don't weight the effect of setting the cause to one value any differently from the effect of setting the cause to any other value. We want to know across its entire range of values, treating them all equally, on average, how much effect do we have when we manipulate that cause? And Woodward thinks that's a good way of understanding the idea of is the causal connection between these two variables a really strong, important, highly explanatory causal connection? Okay. Waters, on the other hand, is, is saying we shouldn't care about uh, relationships that are never manifest in nature. We should only look at those values of the cause that are actually manifested in nature in the class of systems that we're looking at. And we should try and figure out experimentally how much of the actual variation that we observe in the effect in some set of systems we're interested in is due to actual variation in the cause. So they're both perfectly consistent ideas. And what's kind of nice is that both of them can be captured in this way of thinking. And there are other proposals as well which can be captured using other distributions. Um, so briefly and technically, uh, the formula at the bottom is just the expansion. So that's just where we were. Um, that's just where we were, and that's, that's just its expansion. Um, actually, uh, Arnaud's suggestion has been that rather than imposing a maximum entropy distribution over the cause, if we construct the distribution that maximizes this measure, okay, which we're calling a maximum specificity distribution, what we get is the, uh, we now know under ideal conditions what is the most influence you could ever exert using this variable. And we're sort of proposing that as an alternative to Woodward's way of thinking about, in the abstract, how strong, how explanatory is the relationship between these two variables. It's a variation on Woodward's proposal. The formula at the top is actually, uh, we immediately discovered very quickly that this is such a simple idea that lots of people working in computer science and complex system science had already thought of it. So it turns out that the little bit of math that we came up with is equivalent to approaches that other people have come up with in the past. Um, so that formula at the top, which is known as information flow, is published in 2008. Uh, various people at uh, university use it. Um, uh, what it does is it's a slightly more elegant way of thinking about that notion of actual causation. So um, what we do is we observe, so you notice that the little hat, which stands for this variable has been determined by intervention and not merely observed, the little hat has disappeared. So what we're actually doing there is we're controlling by intervention all of the background conditions, observing the distribution of our causal variable, and then in the last part of the formula, the little hat comes back because we're using our background knowledge to remove non-causal aspects of the observed correlation. Okay, so it's getting you the same thing effectively, but it's a more elegant way of doing it. So we now think that information flow, which is already used in the scientific literature as a measure of the actual causal influence of one variable on another in some data set, is a, a really nice formal way of thinking about actual causation, and we recommend using this maximum specificity version of our measure as a way of thinking about, in the abstract, how strongly connected, how explanatory of one another are these two 
variables. Okay. So what I want to do now is to show that this is much more general than a way of thinking about how DNA codes for protein and that it has other uses in biology. Um, so philosophy of biology, those of you that have read the literature, you'll realize is full of long running disputes about whether the practical hegemony of the gene in biological explanation is either a good thing at a practical level, is it, a, is it sort of gene privileging, uh, is there something we ought to change in how we do biology, or more purely philosophically, I even if it is practically the right way to proceed, does it actually ont ontologically represent genes being somehow special or different or at the heart of causation in living systems? Long, lots of long-running disputes. And lots of long-running disputes about the relative importance of genetic causes versus epigenetic causes and other environmental causes that I'll call exogenetic, and I'll explain why in a moment. Okay. Um, what we can do with this framework is to add some rigor to that discussion. We can say, if you're arguing about the relative importance of genetic and epigenetic factors in explaining some outcome in biology, so somebody says, a uh, classic kind of view we talked about earlier, um, the information in living systems comes from their genes, and the environment merely provides supporting conditions under which that information can be read. We've now got a fairly rigorous way of saying, well, is that true? Let's take a model system and let's ask how specific are the genetic and the environmental causes relative to one another. And we did some kind of baby versions of that for little cases of gene expression in that philosophy of science paper. Although you very rapidly discover that even the best understood things in biology, we don't really have the kind of data that you'd want when you, you're, if you're drawing this ideal causal graph, you rapidly discover that you have to make half of it up for even the best understood cases of um, transcription of genes. Um, it makes clear a number of very important issues. The first thing it makes clear, and you may think if you haven't read the literature, why does this need to be made clear? But I can assure you it does. Um, that it makes no sense to discuss the relative importance of genetic versus epigenetic causes unless you specify what you're trying to explain. Um, so if you're within this framework that I've outlined, um, you've got to be clear about what your variables are. There's no point saying genes are really important unless you say, here's the outcome I want to explain, and I claim that the genetic variables explain that outcome far more than these other variables do. And that in in verbal philosophical discussion, when you reconstruct it, you discover that what the outcome variable is, is just jumping all over the place from one paragraph to another. Um, so if you want, this is what's happening in Waters' uh, paper that I talked about earlier on actual causation. And it's, he's actually very careful. Um, so we're explaining why in a single cell at a single time, Individual RNAs are different from one another. So our population of differences is all of the RNAs in one cell at one time, known as its transcriptome. And obviously, they differ from one another, and we want to explain those differences. Okay. Um, now, that's actually a really boring biological problem. Um, it doesn't correspond to any very interesting question, but it's simple enough to think about. Um, what we're far more interested in is the thing at the bottom. Uh, in a certain way, you could say that if you could explain the variations in the transcriptome of cells, both across space and across time within an individual organism, then you would have explained the molecular le aspect of biological development, going from an egg to an adult to death. Okay, is effectively, if you, Whatever it is that controls which transcripts are present at what level in which cell across the body and across time in an organism is controlling the life cycle of the organism from birth to maturity to death. So that problem is actually the problem of development in a certain rather abstract way. But of course, a lot of the time in the philosophy literature, it turns out that what people are discussing is either 
the variations between different organisms. So let's take, for example, the transcriptome in, in, your, in liver cells of a, um, a three-month-old fetus. If it does, yeah, it's got liver cells. Okay, make it a six-month-old fetus to be careful. Okay, so we've got um, a particular cell type in a fetus at a particular point in time, and we notice that the transcriptome in those cells differs between individuals in an evolving population, and we want to explain that. Or you might say there are different species, they have different kinds of um, tissues, and we want to explain the differences between those tissues over evolutionary time as one species diverges from another. Completely different problems, and I won't argue this at length here, but um, I'll just state bluntly, it's deeply implausible that from the fact that when you're trying to explain variation across species over evolutionary time, you find a particular pattern in to what extent that's explained by changes in genetic variables versus changes in non-genetic variables, that you could infer from that that in developmental time, as you go from a fertilized egg to an adult, that the differences between what's going on in different cells at different times and places is explained to the same extent by the genetic and the environmental variables. That's a deeply implausible view that you could jump from one of these to the other, and yet you see it in the existing literature. Okay, so I want to talk about how I use the word epigenetic. Epigenetic is a bit like liberal. You, uh, you, it's impossible to use it without saying what you mean by it. Um, so uh, the original word is, of course, epigenesis, which we're all familiar with from generally the history of science. Um, so epigenesis, an idea that a word that goes back to the early modern period and an idea that goes back much further, um, simply the idea that there is genuine novelty in biological development. Something new happens. Biological development, the, the, the thing that you begin with, the fertilized egg, does not have the same degree of organized complexity as the organism it produces. Okay? That's what's being denied by... Um, so, uh, in this country, for example, by people like uh, Charles Bonnet, what he's denying is that the degree of organized complexity, in, sorry, what he's asserting, he's a, a, he's, when he rejects epigenesis, he's rejecting the claim that the fertilized egg is less complex than the adult organism. Okay. Um, now, in the modern literature, the word gets revived by uh, the great uh, developmental biologist Conrad Waddington in the 40s, and he uses epigenetics in this very broad sense, which you still find in the literature, where epigenetics is the study of the interaction between all of the, the many factors which affect biological development. It's effectively, um, epigenetics is the systems level study of all the genes and many of the other things studied at the systems level. And in a sort of primitive way, Waddington talks about how you would conceive of this thing as a dynamic system and think about its state space and the landscape of that, that dynamic system. Okay. Um, very soon afterwards, the other sense of epigenetics, which is probably the dominant sense in the contemporary literature and certainly the dominant sense in the technical molecular biology literature, is introduced by a biologist called David Nanny. Um, and uh, who knows about Waddington but has his own purposes and is very clear that what he means by it is not just what Waddington means. And it's the study of the mechanisms which determine which parts of the genome are expressed in which cell at which time. Okay, so when you pick up a popular science magazine and it has epigenetics, a revolution in medicine on its front cover, that's what they mean. Okay, epigenetics is the study of the cellular mechanisms that determine which genes are switched on and which genes are switched off. It's very confusing that we have these two senses of epigenetic in the literature. It's particularly confusing because they both have a corresponding sense of epigenetic inheritance, and in that context, people really do get into, not, into disagreements that seem to me to reflect not recognizing what the other guy means by epigenetic inheritance. So um, in our book, Carola Stotz and I suggested that we simply go with the molecular biologists with respect to the use of the phrase epigenetic inheritance. So epigenetic inheritance occurs when 
as you go from a parent cell to an offspring cell, so as cells reproduce, if there is cell line heredity of states of gene expression. So it's not just that one cell gets its genome from the other cell, it also gets the regulated state of that genome. Things are switched on or switched off by inheritance. That's this narrow sense of epigenetic inheritance. It's the one that's conventional in contemporary molecular biology. Let's give our molecular biology colleagues that phrase. They can have it, and we won't get confused if we don't use it. And we follow a couple of biologists um, in Indiana, um, behavioral biologists, in using this word exogenetic inheritance for broader non-genetic inheritance, for non-genetic inheritance that doesn't meet the requirements for being narrowly epigenetic. Okay? Let me give you a very simple and very well-known well example, which you may know. Um, the work of people like Francis Champagne and Michael Meany, a whole group of investigators, on the inheritance, transgenerational inheritance of stress reactivity in the rat. Um, in that case, you have rats differ in how they react to stress. They differ because they have certain genes switched on or switched off through narrow sense epigenetic mechanisms. Baby rats resemble their mothers with respect to which genes they have switched on and switched off and with respect to whether they're highly stress reactive or less stress reactive. But that's not an example of epigenetic inheritance because what happens is that the epigenetic state of the mother influences her behavior with respect to her offspring, which causes the methylation of the relevant genes in the offspring, and then they come to have the phenotype of the mother. It's not the case that a cell with a particular regulated state of gene expression passes that state on to the cell that's produced from it through cell division, and particularly not, in this is a transgenerational case, not through um, the process of formation of gametes not passed on through the eggs and the sperm. Okay? Um, so if we do that, we now have two nice senses. We have genetic, epigenetic and exogenetic inheritance. And now we can look at the really heated dispute within both philosophy of biology and biology about how significant are these compared to genetic inheritance. The first, first person to, so I want to come back to epigenetics. Why did that modern sense of epigenetics get introduced? It got introduced for a fascinating reason. It got introduced in response to Francis Crick introducing that notion of informational specificity and the central dogma of molecular biology. So the modern sense of the word epigenetic is an immediate response to Crick's new way of thinking about how information flows from one cell to the other. Paper comes out in the same year. Um, and he's talking about Crick. And Nanny says, once we have Crick's picture of how information flows through the genetic material, it becomes immediately obvious that there must be another source of information because every cell in the body has the same genome, but something's got to switch them on and switch them off in a regulated order to give rise to development, to give rise to ordered biological systems. And he says, let's call those epigenetic mechanisms. Okay? So it's an immediate response to Crick's informational picture. It basically says, if we're going to explain how life is highly organized by saying that there's a huge amount of information coded in the DNA sequence, then we're going to have to have some other mechanisms to select which bits of that information will be used at a particular time and place. Okay. So, um, Corolla Stotz and I, following various biologists, like to talk about what we call distributed causal specificity. So, if you want to know uh, uh, the example we like because it's a famous example and because it's fun, um, so the uh, Drosophila cell adhesion molecule, there's a gene for the Drosophila cell adhesion molecule, it's called DSCAM, and it has many thousands of different spli differently spliced proteins that can be, can be produced from this one locus. So we have one gene and many thousands of proteins. Okay, and there's a good biological reason for that. We have slight variants of the protein. Okay? So we want to explain 
where the specificity expressed in one biomolecule comes from? And the answer is, in this case, it's coming partly from the DSCAM gene, but it's also coming from the splicing machinery, which is choosing which of these many thousands of variants will be made at a particular time and a particular place. And we can measure that, and we give a sort of baby version of this in that philosophy of science paper. We can, we can build a model of the process with a whole bunch of idealizations in it. Um, and we can just say, if we want to reduce our uncertainty about the structure of this molecule in this cell in a fruit fly, how much will we reduce our uncertainty by knowing the base sequence from which the molecule was transcribed in the DNA? And how much will we reduce our uncertainty by knowing the state of the splicing complex that's going to cut and paste a particular product out of that gene? So we can literally rigorously compare the flow of causal information to a molecule from these two different causes. And it's generalizing that way of thinking about these problems that I think will allow us to go from using slogans like privileging the genes or um, uh, epistemic primacy or whatever to actually making progress on some of these theoretical biology and philosophy disputes about the relative significance of different causes. Okay. Um, so effectively, uh, as I say, Carola Schlotz and I in, in this book in two years ago, um, we like to think about uh, the, the specificity expressed in a molecule as coming from a distributed set of causes in the cell. And it's an empirical problem to track down how much that outcome is being determined across this set of causes. And being people who are very keen on developmental systems theory, we obviously are empirical bet is that the uh, other cellular mechanisms will turn out to have very high degrees of specificity compared to the expectations of some of our uh, philosophical opponents who think that they are merely background conditions, merely conditions under which the information stored in the genome can be expressed. But the nice thing is that we can now actually put that within some sort of rigorous framework. In particular, we can have a little look at this problem. Um, various people at various times, I've named two of them, Stephen Jay Gould and Peter Godfrey Smith, have had the following thought. Maybe back in the 18th century, the preformationists were wrong about the whole embryo being preformed in the sperm or the egg, but maybe they were right that um, the fundamental building blocks of life are preformed because they're written in the DNA. So, okay, so maybe there aren't, uh, Ken Schaffner has a lovely, Ken Schaffner, whose retirement conference I was at last week, has a lovely joke about this in one of his papers. Um, he says that uh, there may not be a homunculus in the head of the sperm, but many people think that there are still many tretunculi in the head of the sperm, little trays waiting to, to grow. Okay. Um, so uh, we would say that um, that picture doesn't hold up that insofar as there's a case to be made for development being a richly epigenetic process in which, to which many factors contribute, there's a case to be made for molecular epigenesis in which even individual molecules actually go through an epigenetic process. There are, of course, cases in which a molecule is literally a, um, can be thought of as a sort of linear image of a piece of DNA. But there are many, many cases, um, which Carol and I have re rejoiced in finding in the scientific literature and holding up, um, in which you have uh, molecules, key molecules in the, um, the biology of living systems, um, which are, for example, uh, um, transcribed from several different places in the genome. Then those transcripts are edited, and then they're all pasted together. So the, um, uh, the image I like is that uh, if the DNA is seen as a sort of linear picture of the molecules of life, then it's a picture painted by Braque around 1910. Okay? It's nude descending a staircase, that kind of a picture. All right. Um, so uh, molecular epigenesis, perhaps, as well as organismal epigenesis. I want to talk a little bit about something which is, um, I, some of you may have seen the paper that uh, uh, Frédéric de Vigamont distributed. Um, I thought I should touch upon this because it's one of the new things in that paper. Um, 
something that's uh, so his on the the left is a kind of the Richard Dawkins I think it is a Richard Dawkins picture I've pinched actually um, of so-called molecular Weismannism which says that uh, genes make well that the genome makes a genome makes a genome the genome makes a body but bodies don't make anything in the next generation okay so there's a flow of information through one genome to another and there's this side effect of phenotypes but those phenotypes don't do anything for future generations and this is a picture by Tobias Uller at Oxford more recently um, with a sort of standard parental effects researcher picture of what's going on. So basically the idea is you've got uh, the uh, fertilized egg which has got both genetic and epigenetic causes going on in it. Um, you've got an environment that's interacting with the fertilized egg but that environment is partly a product of the behavior of parents. And so what you actually get in offspring is a result of, so what are, these are my three categories again, We've, we're talking about genetic, epigenetic and exogenetic heredity all giving you, and I would argue once we think about this in terms of specificity, all providing channels through which information flows to determine biological outcomes. Now something that's very often said is that this might be interesting if you're thinking about biological development, but that only the channel on the far left is of any evolutionary significance. And there's an argument which many people have disputed, but many, I think far more people would assent to, which says the reason that only the channel on the far left is of evolutionary significance is that the other two channels are not stable enough. Um, so uh, the Israeli uh, theoretical biologist uh, Eva Jablonka uh, has a famous paper in which she accumulates all of the evidence she can find for multi-generational epigenetic inheritance in plants and animals. And she's trying to show, to answer this criticism. But there we are talking about epigenetic inheritance over perhaps three or four generations at the most. Okay, So even somebody who's a perhaps the most important enthusiast for the evolutionary importance of epigenetic inheritance feels the need to say I've got to show that epigenetic inheritance can be stable for more than one generation if it's to really compete on the evolutionary stage. Now I've really never really understood this argument and so uh, I guess I want to make what I think is a fairly simple point that uh, the question is which of these different heredity channels has the potential to affect what happens in the long run over evolutionary time? And the way that that question is normally considered is in terms of, well, if, if a change is to be of evolutionary significance, the change has to go on being there. Okay, it has to go on being there all the way through. The question is whether or not that is actually a sensible way to think about being of evolutionary significance. The other way to think about it is what effects, if we have a particular selection regime, so the environment makes particular demands on the organism, what determines where evolution will go? And you might think that if something is important for determining what will happen when an organism is subject to particular selective demands, that looks like a pretty good definition of something having significance for evolution. But actually, if you look at it that way, it's uncontroversial that the other two channels have a big impact on evolution. So if you're doing evolution, one of the core things that, that constitutes evolutionary theory is quantitative genetics. Quantitative genetics tells you if you take a bunch of phenotypes in one generation, what will the phenotypes in the next generation look like? Okay. If you change the mapping between the phenotypes of the individuals who successfully reproduce and the phenotypes of their offspring, your evolutionary models will take you to completely different equilibria or completely different um, trajectories through a state space. Okay? Um, so it seems to me that the idea that if a heredity mechanism 
doesn't produce changes which then stay around for a very long time, it can't affect evolution, is a straightforward non sequitur. It confuses the phenotypic level with the genotypic level. Of course it's true that if you create a phenotype and can't pass it on to your offspring, then that phenotype isn't going to evolve. But that's not the same thing as if your offspring systematically look different from the way they would have looked were it not for this other heredity mechanism, then evolution will take you to a different place. So it seems to me that the evolutionary significance of uh, these other mechanisms should be assessed in terms of build a dynamic model of what will evolve under a given set of selection pressures, add epigenetic inheritance, and see whether the model gives you a different evolutionary outcome. And that, of course, has been done many times by quantitative geneticists. And the answer is, yes, it does, in a big way, pretty reliably. So little challenge, I just think that if the epigenetic and exogenetic mechanisms have an important effect in development, it's simply going to follow ipso facto that they are significant for thinking about evolution. So I will skip that one. I'll just do this one. Um, the way we like to think about exogenetic heredity, which is perhaps the least known, the way we like to think about epigenetic heredity, exogenetic heredity, is via another notion from the same biologists that uh, Carola Stotz and I stole the word exogenetic from. Um, it's the idea of a developmental or ontogenetic niche. Roughly, the idea is that we ask ourselves, how does evolution design systems which create offspring that resemble their parents? Okay, the big question is, how does evolution design systems that can create offspring that resemble their parents? And a little quirky addition to that, we need to recognize that that's not the only thing evolution does. If you remember my little seed beetle, what the seed beetle does is to create offspring which either resemble the parent or are different from the parent in an adaptive way. Okay? So you can actually think of creating offspring that resemble their parents as a special case of creating offspring whose phenotypes are adaptive given the reproductive interests of their parents. Okay? It's not the case that the aim of a reproducing organism is to make babies that look like it. The aim of a reproducing organism is to make babies that will have many babies themselves. And there are two ways to do that. If you're a well-designed organism, you can ensure your offspring have babies by making them like you, so they too will be well-designed for the environment in which they live. But in variable environments, actually, what you need to do is to have a series of different kinds of offspring that you can produce in response to environmental cues. So Stotz and I think that, in fact, to think clearly about this problem, you need a conception of heredity in which heredity is not like makes like, it's like makes adaptive. OK? Um, so having generalized heredity like that, we can say, how do organisms solve that problem? Well, one thing, a key thing they've done, perhaps the key innovation, I would say you know, the key innovation in the history of life is finding a way of taking all of the brilliant chemical tricks that an organism has and passing those chemical tricks through cell line heredity onto the next generation. And to do that, there's no way anybody can think of of doing that without using genetic nucleic acid heredity. So at the heart of this set of heredity systems, there's, and Sahotra Sarkar said this in a wonderful paper some 20 years ago now, the real point why genes are so cool is they let you take this incredibly complicated chemistry and pass it on to the next generation in a way that's sequestered from environmental insult. So that's incredibly important. But at the same time, you need to pass on a huge amount of regulatory organization. And you do that via narrow sense epigenetic heredity. And you can also use narrow sense epigenetic heredity to create a certain amount of this adaptive phenotypic plasticity. But the third thing that systems designed by evolution do is to 
rather than taking their eggs and just sort of kicking them out of the window to make a living, they place their eggs into highly structured developmental niches. And as human beings, we ought to be particularly sensitive to this because we invest a large part of our lives in main building, maintaining, and sustaining developmental niches for our offspring. Um, we're a, an organism with uh, not only in the classic sense that some of you may have heard of, sort of florid niche construction, creating our selective environments. We also engage in florid developmental niche construction in creating these extraordinarily complex and highly specific environments in which human infants develop normally. And if you want the science of that, a good place to start is with the complexity of breast milk. I mean, so breast milk, I, I now think of breast milk as roughly like plugging into the internet and just downloading extraordinary amounts of information, okay? Um, and I don't mean information about physiology as well, information about environments. It's, it's yeah, it's a kind of information superhighway from mother to offspring, okay? So what we, uh, this notion of a developmental niche basically says the third aspect of heredity is all the ways in which organisms structure the environment of their offspring so that the regulated genetic system gets the cues it needs in order for a normal life cycle or one of the variant life cycles for that organism to unfold. Okay, so there's genetic, epigenetic, and exogenetic information. They're all contributing to this fundamental problem organisms have to solve, namely of ensuring that their offspring are highly adaptive and go on to reproduce successfully by equipping them with the phenotypic traits they need to do that. All three kinds of, of information to play a key role in development, I would argue, although of course that's an empirical question, and if they play that key role in development, then they play an important role in evolution. And that's it. I'll finish with some acknowledgments. Great. Mm. Oh. Thank you very much. Uh, one thing that I don't perfectly understand about your framework, about the, uh, your uh, specificity definition of information, uh, is what do you make of uh, maladaptive specificity? So, for instance, I'm thinking of the example of a pa parasite manipulating the behavior of an ant or any, any example. Uh, you, I mean, the causal effect of the parasite on the brain of the ant is very specific. And yet, you don't, you don't want to say that this, uh, say, molecule that's affecting the behavior of the ant, you don't want to say that this molecule is an information from the point of view of the ant. And the reason why is, is it's not theological, it's not adaptive. Ah. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a manipulation and not an information. I thought, I, th I thought you were going to, there, there's a very, I think, a, um, an important objection very close to that. But this is the teleosemantic point. I guess I just don't agree with that. Um, um, I don't think that you should define information in terms of whether or not something serves a purpose. I think it's fine to do that. I and mean, there's nothing, um, look, uh, so there, there are two things, two ways you could object. So I want to say that I'm going to regard uh, specificity as a measure of the biological information in a cause with respect to an effect. There are two ways you could object to that. One is to say, I don't like calling that information. The other is to say, if you do that, you get results that look biologically meaningless and, and un unhelpful. Now, with respect to the ant, I think the second objection doesn't apply. Um, we have two competing individuals. One is making the world one way, one's making it the other. Um, no. Uh, with respect to, well, should you call it information at all? Um, you know, uh, it's not like there's a, you know, sort of a little, there, there's some chap up in, in Plato's heaven guarding the form of information, right? Um, so it's just a question of does it have enough intellectual continuity with vernacular speech to be legitimate? And I think it has enough continuity with vernacular speech. Um, I think, and I would argue that, so for example, we've got forthcoming paper uh, coming out where we, um, we look at uh, developmental biologists for many years have had a very difficult to understand distinction between permissive and instructive interactions between tissues. And we think we can now throw light on what they mean by instructive. Why are they using that language? 
using this sort of framework. So we think sort of across biology, you find this phenomena of people starting to throw information talk around when what they're talking about is why you get exactly this outcome rather than, yeah, just supporting causes. Um, just one other little thing. Here's a reason, one very powerful reason why you shouldn't think that tedious semantic information is the right kind of information for biology. Because if there's one thing that everybody, and people have argued about this, but you know, 90% of the people in the world who finished high school believe that when we talk about DNA coding for RNA for protein, we're talking about an informational relationship. And that relationship's not tedious semantic. If I take a piece of, of totally maladaptive, I get a de novo mutation that's going to kill me. That mutation still expresses something in the genetic code. It codes for a variant codon. It codes for an amino acid substance. It's a completely non-teleological notion. So, but just not to object to teleological notions. Hi. Uh, at some point, you, you brushed upon the debate of whether the environment contains as much information as the genome in that sense of informational specificity that you have defined. And I'm wondering whether it's a good debate at all to have because, like, I mean, well, of course, the answer may depend on each specific environmental factor. Mm -hmm. But if you take something like nutrition, it's obviously a very non-specific factor because it has effects on all aspects of the organism, basically. Uh, and still, it is very important. So, so how much information it contains is not a measure of how important it is, is it? That's a fantastic question. Um, let me say two things that I think will be helpful and clarifying um, in response. So the first one, the more general one, um, I think what my framework or our framework, I'm in no way solely responsible for this, it's very much joint work with my group. Um, uh, what our framework uh, lets you do is to identify, you're quite right that in general, you know, are, are the genes more important than the environment? I mean, that is indeed a very, it's too ill-formed a question to be useful. However, if what you want to say is, I'm interested in uh, how organisms succeed in deploying a series of adaptive responses to the environments they encounter at each stage of their life. How do they succeed in doing the right thing rather than the wrong thing? Which you can understand either phenotypically or you can kind of understand it more reductionistically in terms of how do they succeed in having the right gene switched on and the right gene switched off and the products of those genes um, post transcriptionally processed in the right way. Okay, so two, you know, you can think about it in terms of, you know, whether I succeed in being the right color to match the background or you can think of it at the molecular level. Do I succeed in producing the right molecules at the right time? Um, then you can say, if an organism succeeds in doing that, and we want to causally explain why it did that rather than the huge range of less adaptive alternatives, which were all um, sort of thermodynamically accessible, would take no more energy to do, okay? Um, then I think we can actually start looking at the role of, so as long as we're specific in what we're talking about as our outcome variable. Uh, another very specific version you can look at, um, people who are debating the uh, causes of the origin of novelty in evolution. Um, so you want to know where um, fundamentally novel structures in morphology come from. And you want to know in the production of those innovations, um, is, it, this is, is it sort of, you know, uh, genes as leaders or genes as followers, it's as, as it's sometimes put, right? Um, and again, what you're, you're sort of asking is in the initial induction of potentially adaptive variation, um, you know, which factor is doing more of the explaining. So with respect to nutrition, I would recommend my um, Australian colleagues, Steve Simpson and David Romanheimer's book, The Nature of Nutrition. Um, nutrition is a large number of variables to which organisms display highly specific responses in very specific aspects of their physiology. Actually, I think nutrition's got quite a lot of information. Um, if you want to, I mean, I think organisms are, continually um, responding adaptively on both physiological and developmental timescales to the specific values of a large range of variables they're measuring on the nutritional intake. So actually, I think nutrition does quite well from this point of view. Thank you, that was helpful. Uh, 
I have a question whether you maybe uh, can re-elaborate how your notion of information as specificity differs from sort of standard information theory for me. Because in the talk it seems so you had this notion of specificity, mm -hmm. but then specificity just turned out to be the mutual information between a set of courses and, and, and some output. And then also your concept of maximum specificity is just uh, sort of the channel capacity if you, mm -hmm. if you, if you, if you know standard information theory. Yeah. So in what way does talking about specificity bring a different perspective yeah. on, of Good. Thanks on very information? Much. It's really simple. Um, it's exactly the same in, uh, you know, Nihat I and, and Polanyi's work and other people, and Kevin Korb's work at Monash. Um, everybody's doing the same thing. You take information theoretic measures and you combine them with Judea Pearl's intervention operator. So some of the variables in the equation are subject to the intervention operator. So their value is not observed, but determined by intervention, by, the, by experiment. So what you're effectively, I call it causal information theory. Some people think that's a bit grandiose. It's effectively information theory which only measures correlations that are also causal. It extracts the causal component of the data. And, but it, other than that, it's exactly the same. So the computer science people who are interested in this are people who are interested in, they want to, to basically do, say, systems biology, and they want to do big data analysis in a way that's getting at what's making what happen rather than just at correlation data. That's why they're interested in this stuff. It's very simple. Yeah. Which is why, at the moment we thought of it, we discovered lots of other people have thought of it. It's incredibly simple. Um, Paul. I have a question about your characterization of, um, of biological information in terms of uh, causal specificity. So while you're making it more natural, of course, but uh, I would like, well, is this a definition or a characterization? Because uh, if biological information is some kind of ca causal specificity, would it, would it could it be possible to say, well, wherever we see causal specificity in chemistry, in physics, in geology, etc., we could speak of information, and you know that a lot of physicists do this. What do you answer to this? Yeah, um, yeah thanks, John. That's also very helpful. Um, so uh, I'm not sure my collaborators would agree with this. Um, I have quite sort of, you know, sort of a big picture view of what we're doing by thinking about biological systems in informational terms. So I guess the claim is that, uh, of course, these measures can be applied to any physical system. And one of the nice things about it is that it, it puts uh, what's happening in a cell on the same level as what's happening in you know, the formation of a crystal or whatever it might be. But the, what I would like to claim is that What's distinctive about living systems is that they ha there are a very large number of variables through which that system exercises very fine-grained control over its, what's happening inside itself in a way that's adaptive. Okay? So the claim is, what's the difference between a cell and an, a thing with an equal number of parts and lots and lots of complexity, but from a biological point of view, clearly not alive and really boring, is that it's not, ex it's not being adaptive via having a great deal of control over how it responds to what happens to itself, how, to what it encounters. So as it meets its environment, it has an enormous amount of control over what it does in response to its environment. And also, in a sort of Bernardian sense, obviously an enormous amount of control about how it maintains its milieu in turn. That's another kind of, so. The claim is that's what's distinctive about living systems. And actually, I think that's not exactly a new idea. It's, it's an idea that's been around, you know, I can find biologists saying that for the last 250 years. Um, it's just that we sort of express it in this very straightforward information theoretic way. Um, I mean, I hope we've, we won't, uh, um, the last time somebody tried to combine biology with information theory in Brooks and Wiley's um, Thermodynamics of Life, it didn't end well. But I'm hoping that the fact that what we're doing is so incredibly 
simple and peasant-like will, will, you know, will make this more useful. Mm. I have a question which is probably naive because I'm very far from your, your field. It seems to me, even in the, you know, the way people talk about information and, and genetics, even in the popular Mm. Uh, world that has to do also with um, an implicit analogy with language and with the fact that we have a when people talk in terms of the code uh, mm. I think what seems to play a role is also the fact that you have discrete units and that maybe you have some level of composition compositionality mm. I don't know whether that is the case mm. uh, that that play a role in the reason why people like to use you know the vocabulary of information to, to talk about that mm. yeah look thanks another great question so um, uh, People who there's been a lot of good uh, work on that in um, philosophy of biology. Uh, I'm blanking on Israeli guy's name. Uh, anyway, uh, Peter Godfrey Smith's written some really good stuff about that. Um, and uh, one of his students, uh, Aaron Levy, I think, a lot of very, you know, really careful analysis of what's going on there. Um, so you're absolutely right. That's one major reason why people are so drawn to this. On the other hand, that doesn't mean it's a good thing. Um, my view is that if, and various people like Sahotra Sarkar again have written about this in philosophy of biology, I guess my view is if you look at attempts to think philosophically about the notion of information in biology from the sort of basically the 1960s to the present, we've got good inductive evidence that the following intellectual strategy leads to disaster. Start with really complicated intentional representations. Look for analogies with what's going on in biology and get excited about them. Right? It's been tried so many times and it's always been a disaster. Um, my view is start simple. Start with something like Shannon that we really understand and use it to show that a simple notion of information can do real work in analyzing, you know, boring, solid, well-understood bits of biology. And maybe at one day we'll be able to say something about representation or something like that, but, you know, whatever. If we can understand, I mean, the kind of problems that my little group is actually working on at the moment are really very mundane. For example, measuring causal information flow in gene regulatory networks seems to identify, we will argue, really cool abstract properties of the networks which are targets of selection at a kind of higher level than just what's wired to what. So they're kind of informational properties which are targets for natural selection. Um, you know, and that's, that's, that's great. Whereas I'm, you know, the kind of the idea that, of, and I'll be rude about some other nice people again, I mean, you know, the idea that we should start with Charles Saunders Peirce's semiotics and use that to understand molecular biology, it's been tried, it's a bad idea. Keep it simple, all right. Thank <laughs> you.